Hello, First Church family, and blessings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, as we continue looking at our topic of generosity, we're going to begin worship by celebrating the great gift of God's word, celebrating God's generosity towards us by giving us, reaching out to us and giving us all that is contained within the Bible, covenants, instruction, call, comfort, promises, and hope. So if you have your Bible right there with you, I invite you to grab that and put your hand of blessing on it as we celebrate the giving and the receiving of God's word with our children and youth today. So let's take a look and let's open our hearts to God's word. From Proverbs chapter 3. King Solomon advised his son, my child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Children receive the word of God, learn its stories and study its words. Its stories belong to all of us, and these words speak to all of us. They tell us who we are. They tell us we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. Let us join together. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray God will guide you, your family, and us as you use this holy Bible in your home in your church, school, classes, and in our worship. We will learn together and grow in our love for God's word. Guys have this correct? 
So let's go ahead and read it together. And then the children or the kids, they will answer as well. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thanks be to God. Now the kids, repeat after me. We receive these Bibles with our hands, our hearts, and our minds. All right, my friends or so parents, let me guide you. Please put your, uh, extend your hands over your children. On the kids, please hold the Bibles on your hands, okay? And let us pray together at this time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with your word. Your word will both tell us who you are and who we are as your children. Send your Holy Spirit upon these children and parents that as they read your word, their hearts may always be open to receive with joy what you have to say to them. And God's people say, Amen. Families, we are delighted to have shared this milestone moment with you. Please encourage family and friends to sign in your children's Bibles. It's a tradition here at First Church, and Pastor Caesar and Pastor Lisa and I have started you off, but parents especially, find the scripture that means something to you and sign in your child's Bible because it will be so meaningful to them. Share with grandparents, aunts and uncles and friends. Ask them to sign your child's Bible that we are community and God's people together. And so with that, uh, we promised just a short service this evening and I'll share a blessing and send us out. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may all abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask blessings on these children and families and we send them off with these Bibles with great love and much light. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, friends. Uh, the first scripture reading for today, again, is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. Again, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses uh, 41 and 42. And I'm going to read the version, the New King James Version. And the Word of God says, And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. 
Give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, my friend, let me invite you. Let us close your eyes and pray together at this time. Pray to our God, believing that God is listening at this time to each one of us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the great opportunity again to open our eyes this morning. Thank you, Father, for that. Father, at this time, I'm going to give you thanks, Lord, for our family, for our husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, all our loved ones, those who are close with us or those who are living far away from us. Father, at this time, we pray that you can continue extending your loving hand upon them as you all, always do for us. Father, thank you for response our prayers. Thank you, Father, for listening our prayers this morning. And thank you, Lord, for continuing to keep us safe and healthy in the middle of this pandemic. Father, we're going to give you thanks, Lord, for our jobs. We're going to give you thanks for our house, our home, our roof, the place that we can stay and we can sleep well. We pray Father, for those who doesn't have a place to stay last night or the last week. We pray those for those children and families that, uh, that they don't have anything to eat at this moment. Father, we pray that you can provide that meal for them. Thank you, Father. And we extend, in, Father, your love upon them through our prayers that you can continue to listen to us, Father. And please, please provide whatever they need, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. Thank you, Father, for our church. Thank you, Father, for every single ministry. Thank you, Lord, for this worship service that we put in together uh, to serve your people. We pray, Father, that you can speak to, to every single person, Father, through every single thing that we do here through this worship service. We pray, Father, that you can reveal your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit to every single heart, Father. We pray, Lord, that you can open the minds of every single person who is watching this worship service, Father, and you can go inside their thoughts. You can go, Father, inside of their hearts, and you can reveal your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for each one of them, for each one of us. Father, thank you. Thank you. And thank you always. Lord, in the middle of this season, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of this difficult situation that our world is working, is doing, we pray, Lord, that you can extend in your merciful hand. And please, Father, have mercy on us, extending your grace upon us, upon this world. Lord, we need you. We need you more today than yesterday. We pray, Lord, for those families at this moment who mourn uh, the death of their loved ones. We pray, Lord, for those people who are sick and in the hospitals right now or they are on their beds. We pray, Lord, for those uh, people who are in hospice. We pray, Lord, for those people who are not feeling well. We pray, Lord, for those people who are struggling with suicidal thoughts. We pray, Father, for every single creature. But especially, Lord, we pray that you can put in our mouths words of hope and life to those people. Guide us and give us, Lord, every single day, the strength that we need to continue sharing the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. And today, as body united, as body of Christ, we pray that prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now in Spanish. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Vénganos hoy tu reino y hágase tu voluntad, así la tierra como en el cielo. Danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día y perdona nuestras ofensas, así como nosotros también perdonamos a aquellos que no nos ofenden. Y no nos dejes caer en la tentación, mas líbranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, la gloria y el poder. En God's people say, Amen. God bless you all. I wish you could have known my grandmother, Ruth Cruz. Well, both of my grandmothers, but today I want to say something about my one grandma, Ruth. She lived to be 101 years old, and she had one of those uh, expressions of faith and way of being with her faith that was just like her second skin. She uh, lived her faith fully and truthfully all of her days. She was unafraid of just saying to someone, now remember, God really does love you. She was not afraid of praising the name of the Lord. Her faith in God's goodness never wavered, even when she went through some of the most trying times anyone can go through. When she passed away five years ago, my sister and I uh, were going through her possessions and figuring out what to do with them, as you do. And uh, we came across her coin collection. And as we were sharing those coins out and looking at them, my sister felt it was most appropriate for me to have one of those coins in the collection. And that coin was a widow's mite. Uh, Grandma has a an ancient coin that literally is the very coin that um, would have been given um, by the widow who gave this tiny little copper coin in the gospel stories. And we're going to hear that in just a minute. The coin, uh, you can have a closer look at it right here. The coin is actually called a lepton. And a lepton is the smallest and least valuable coin in circulation in Judea in Jesus's time. It was worth, one of those coins was worth about six minutes of manual labor. It's like what a penny might seem to us today. And we might think like with a lepton, um, or this little mite of a, of a coin, a little bit of wealth, tiny little bit of wealth. You might think, well, what can a penny, what can a lepton get you anyway? What's it really worth? Now, kids, if you want to get your grandparents talking about something, ask them about penny candy, and they'll tell you what a penny used to be worth. But today, you might think, well, what is a penny really worth? What good is a penny? So our story today may help us think about that a little bit and answer some of those questions. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And I invite you to open those Bibles um, and read along with me. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, 
As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, you will notice that I stopped with Jesus' statement at that point, that I didn't go on with what followed. For what follows is a long conversation that he and the disciples have about the destruction of the temple and the sign of the times and the end of times and, and how to read those times and that sort of thing. And, and um, we could get very distracted with all of that and miss the point of what had just been witnessed. As a matter of fact, that seems to be what the disciples experienced themselves. They got very distracted and moved along very quickly from Jesus' teaching about the widow's offering. They got caught up in a much bigger and different conversation without seriously considering what Jesus had just taught them. So I want to invite us to stop for a moment and not get distracted by all the rest of that, but to consider what Jesus had just taught them. Taught them. What Jesus had, was teaching them was about the offering that the widow gave. Two small copper coins, leptons, Rubbed together, they're hardly worth anything. They're worth 12 minutes worth of work. At today's minimum wage, I did some calculation at today's minimum wage, it might be worth $2 total. The disciples seemed to miss the point because they were looking at the amount, that the amount was so small as to be negligible. It didn't really matter. Maybe they were impressed with the larger coins that the other folks were putting in. Maybe those larger coins made a much larger sound in the temple treasury as they were dropped in. They made more important sounds, perhaps, and the two tiny little copper coins. I mean, because they really are very tiny, they would probably hardly make a sound at all as they were dropped in that um, treasury box. It seems that the disciples missed the point because their immediate response to Jesus commenting about the widow's offering, their, their response to that was to look, look at the grandiose, grandiosity of the temple. Look at the beautiful stones. Look at this structure, Jesus, how grand it is. Look at the rich gifts that have been dedicated to God. They were wowed if you will, by the grandiosity of the structure and seem to, as they were saying that, seem to indicate that the widow's offering was not important. Uh, certainly those two copper coins would have maybe gotten 12 minutes from somebody who was sweeping the floor perhaps and that it really wasn't all that valuable considering the, the greater value of the entire temple. At least that's what I feel like the disciples were saying. It seems like they were missing the point of what Jesus had just said. They were impressed with Perhaps the size of the gifts that can build a grand structure. But Jesus' teaching tells us that he was impressed with the size of faith. With the size of faith that was displayed by this widow. So let's talk about that woman's faith for a moment. Let's talk about that. Let's think about the faith that had been expressed in dropping those two copper coins, which Jesus said was all that she had to live on. It must have indicated, I think, of her complete trust in God's provision. If she had all that she had to live on was in those two little copper coins, and she dropped them. What kind of faith must that be to relinquish all that you have to live on? What would compel you to give your last little bit of money, that last little bit 
of security. That must be a very deep faith in God's provision. Maybe, maybe that widow was calling to mind some stories of God's provision, God's love, God's generosity to other widows in the faith tradition. There's a story about Elijah. Elijah um, was uh, trying to ride out the famine. There was a drought in the land. And he was told by God to go to the widow at Zarephath and, um, until it was going to rain again. And that widow at Zarephath, well, she only had a little jug of oil and a little jar of flour. And she was going to make one last meal. And then that was going to be the end, the end of all of her provision. And she said, we're going to eat this and then we will prepare to die. But in that whole time, Every day, she made loaves of bread from flour and oil. And during that entire drought, the jar of flour and the jug of oil never ran out. There was always provision made by God. It's a great story of miracle. It's a great story of God's intervention. It's a great story that must have spoken to that widow and said, I, I can trust, I can make my offering because I completely trust in God's provision for me because God has provided it in the past, not only to the widow at Zarephath, but also to the ancestors in uh, the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. Did not God every single day give them what they needed? Maybe she was able to give that offering because she had such complete trust that God would still provide for her needs as he had to her ancestors long before. There's another story that maybe she called to mind um, as she gave her offering. There was a story of a widow that Elisha, who was the prophet that followed Elijah, um, that, uh, that widow, she had a debt to pay and her children were going to be sold into slavery. And she was so completely distraught because she didn't want to lose her children um, to pay a debt. And so Elisha said to her, what do you have? And she says, I only have this one jug of oil and it's not enough to sell. It's not enough to pay the debt. And Elisha said, go and get as many empty vessels from your neighbors, find them, scrounge them from wherever and bring them home and close your door and start filling them from the jug of oil that you have. And so she did. And she filled every single one of those other vessels with oil poured just from the one vessel of oil that she had. Then she was able to take those jugs of oil, sell them, and pay off the debt so her children weren't sold into slavery. Maybe that widow, in order to be able to give such an offering as that, maybe that widow was recalling that story of another widow who was taken care of. Whatever it was, she didn't just think about the law-informed instruction of a tithe of, a, of 10%. That day, her heart drove her, her heart spoke to her to give 100%. Because she must have trusted. She must have trusted in God to be able to do that. She wasn't going to be able to trust in those two little coins. What could they have gotten her anyway? Let's talk about that widow's faith for a moment. Not only did, it, did her offering signify a deep trust in God, I believe that her offering also gave great honor to God as well. She was glorifying and praising the Lord in that act. Her act, her offering was pure praise, pure prayer. Oh, those two little coins couldn't have added much to the structure of the temple. It couldn't have paid any priest's salary or anything like that. But her giving them 
added great honor because they were given in such deep faith, gave great honor to the name of the Lord. For her gift was pure prayer. So this widow, this widow who gives two small little copper coins that are hardly worth anything, she gives a great gift. And her offering teaches us a couple of things. It teaches us that trust in the Lord is one of the foundations to live a generous life. Trust in the Lord is one of the foundations to lead a generous life. We're thinking about generosity in this series. What does it take to live a generous life? Well, the widow teaches us that trust Trust in the Lord helps us to lead a generous life. But not only that, the widow's offering also teaches us that in order to live a generous life, it is about honoring the Lord, giving the name of the Lord praise. That also is a foundation for living a generous life. You know, there were a lot of people giving their offering that day at the temple. Jesus watched them. He says he looked up, he was watching them, and he saw the widow in that. Rich people, poor people giving their offering. And I imagine he watches over us today as well as we give our offerings. No matter how we give, we give offerings in lots of ways these days, whether it's uh, mailed in, online, stuck under a door, or something like that. So let me close by saying a little bit about our offerings to the work of the church today. It's a very short little thing. Basically, your offerings are important. Your offerings are important. And I say that not just for all the good reasons of supporting the ministry of First Church, even though that does happen, your offerings make things happen, but your offerings are important not just for that. And your offerings are important not just to create a budget that makes programs possible, although that happens. And your offerings are important, um, in its, and it's not to alleviate guilt or to try and buy righteousness with God or to impress other people. That's, that's not what makes your offerings important, nor to, to fulfill any of the uh, numerous passages of Scripture that we could quote about making an offering. I want us to remember today that our offerings are important because they indicate, they actually, in living a generous life, it's not just about making something happen, but it's about living out something that's already inside of us. It's living out that trust, really enacting that trust, as, as you know, practicing the faith, if you will. And it really is about honoring the Lord, adding praise and glory to the already magnificent name of our God and Savior. Your offerings are important. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the great examples of faith, particularly today as we think about um, the widow who put her offering in the temple treasury. She lived, she gave, and she lived out of what must have been such a deep faith in you. She must have lived so closely with you that she was able to honor you and trust you by giving that offering. We thank you for her witness, and we thank you for the witness of all those who have come before us that have helped to tell your story, helped to give you 
honor and glory in this world. People whose lives and whose expressions of faith have informed our own. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us, that we too live with such trust in you and live with such a priority of honoring your name in all things. So bless the offerings that we bring, we pray. May you add your blessing to them so that they may be used to glorify and build your kingdom here on earth. Bless the gifts and bless the givers. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Blessings. Because of your generosity, the work of the church continues to make differences in people's lives as we will hear today from Jim Nelson. How long have you been, uh, been a member of First Church? Can you think back that far? That's a long ways to think. <laughs> we, <laughs> we joined, I think it was Palm Sunday in 1975. So it's 45 years. Goodness. That's longer that's than long. you've been around. That's true. That is uh, longer than I've been around. Well, I guess from the from the get-go, when we first moved to Crystal Lake, uh, our first thing that we, we did was to come to First United Methodist Church to find a home. We were, we were going to church shop for the first time in our lives because uh, every other time we knew somebody in the church or, or we had some kind of connection. Artie and I just feel that... Uh, we raised our boys here, uh, and we got involved rather quickly, and that's been our life. I have a passion for, for serving and for being involved and knowing what's going on in the, in the church. You're in a small group. I know you're part of the, the United Methodist Men's uh, Ministry, and I know you serve on uh, mission trips and things like that. Um, what is sort of your, what is, what's your motivation, your primary motivation for um, being involved in those ministries? What, what do you feel keeps calling you to, to serve and to uh, volunteer and to be a part of the, uh, God's family here at First Church? You know, I guess it's, it's because that's why I'm here on earth, it is to serve, to be involved and, and uh, there's nothing greater in my mind than going on mission trips. And I didn't start that until after I retired. Going on a week-long mission trip had always been my, my desire, but uh, for one reason or another, I was never able to do it until after we had retired. Bob Ripple, Hank Whitley, and I wanted to go on a mission trip. And it was post Katrina and Pastor Heath got together with us and we dilly dallied around. We couldn't figure out if we want where we wanted to go or what we wanted to do. And finally she got the three of us together and she said, I don't care where you guys go, just go. And when we came back after that, uh, Bob Ripple and Carl Moon, Bill Malkins, uh, Jim uh, Mickelson, and myself came back, changed people. It changed our lives. I think that most people probably aren't quite as involved as you and Artie are. How would you encourage them to make First Church a priority in their sort of life of service and their life of generosity? I, I would like to digress just a little bit on this, Tyler. Artie and I, the church is our family. So when we moved here, this, we adopted Crystal Lake or the church as our family. Uh, to answer your question, how do you get, encourage other people to get involved in it? Uh, I guess, try it, you'll like it. Uh, it's it's just great to have your family 
be the church. And, and uh, we were like a lot of other younger people in our, of our age. We raised our kids together. So we're a better place to raise your kids together than in the church. I just have the deepest gratitude for um, how you've shaped First Church, or at least been a part of shaping uh, the First Church family, um, because uh, it's been a great place to be at. So thank you very much for your continued um, service to God's kingdom, uh, especially in this congregation. Isn't that what we're here for? I think so. Yeah. Okay. We're just doing what we're supposed to do.
Friends, before we go for today, a couple of announcements to share. First of all, a reminder that our service times for in-person worship have changed from 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock to 9.30 and 11. The 9.30 service is the traditional service, a lot of what you see online, and it's going to begin incorporating our pre-recorded musical selections as well as a part of that in-person worship experience. The 11 o'clock service will continue on as our FX family service celebration. So if you're ready to join us in person, please, Make sure to make a reservation and we will look forward to seeing you here. The second thing I want to share is that once again, um, Habitat for Humanity Service Day is scheduled September, uh, Saturday the 26th um, will be our work day. And we just celebrated dedicating um, the three completed houses, and there's another one on the way if you haven't already noticed on McHenry Avenue. So if that's um, something that you're ready to do, please uh, sign up. You can do so through our e-news. And now friends, let us remember as we live lives of generosity that we do so mirroring the generous way of our Lord, the one who has loved us so completely as to give his son for us. So in all that we do, may we do so in deep faith and trust that God is with us. So go forth in peace and grace in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.